One, two, three. Let's bring this uh, meeting to order. Uh, this is a meeting right. of the City Council at uh, Council Chambers, 10 West State Street. Today's date is May 29, 2018, over the noon hour. Yesterday was Memorial Day, which explains the uh, odd time and, and date. Uh, notice to the public, please limit your remarks to three minutes and don't direct them at any one of us in particular. And it's up to the uh, council and the staff whether to answer questions or not. We've been called to order. Let's uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Cahill? Here. Gowdy? Here. Hoop? Here. Isom? Lamer? Here. Martin? Here. Wearn? Uh, down to item E, uh, time for council and administrator comments. I'd like to comment on the fact that over the weekend, uh, or this last weekend, there was uh, an open house at the uh, amphitheater at the Grimes Farm. It was well attended. Anita O'Gara from the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation was there. Uh, wonderful event and it's a really pretty venue and it's one of three venues actually four that have music lined up this summer so for the uh, under 40 population that that would like to have the quality of life things like uh, th the music at the Iowa River Brewing or at the uh, uh, Orpheum Th Theater and now at the at, um, uh, amphitheater as, as well. Oh, and Busby Meadery actually uh, yesterday had had an event that uh, was well attended. Um, th there are things to, to listen to if you're a music fan, and that's kind of fun to have around Marshdown. Uh, are there any comments from the uh, city councilors or from our administrator? Your Honor, yes. I have one. <clears throat> I would like to add at the end of our discussion as a discussion item. Um, when we get th when we get down there, I'd like to add a little discussion on mosquito spring, and I'd like to add a, a discussion on the. <coughs> I am really upset with the outside landscaping at the library. It looks terrible. I mean, it's terrible. I got pasture grass for my cows that look better than this library, and that's terrible. <coughs> so I want to have a discussion on that, please. We didn't provide 24 hours notice, so yeah. we need to move it to the next. We'll probably have to move if that. If they're just the discussion one. items, it, they don't have to have a notice, do they? Make your yes. You okay. Make them right now. All right. Uh, for whatever's worth, uh, we did get an email back from the assistant director at the library. The uh, librarian had been on vacation out east, and they they do have people working on uh, uh, that we control. Um, any other comments from the counselors? Uh, let me let me tell you why I had that comment. Uh, we had we had a a group of consultants come in, and they looked at downtown Marshalltown and 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 wrote us a really really nice report that said if we could build the library where we build it, and we could use that as a footprint to work our way uptown. Well, let's get it right before we start going uptown and and it isn't the footprint that these people put in that report and I hate to see us take a report accept it pay a lot of money for it and throw it on the shelf let's do what they said to do and we can we've got the one alleyway now for pedestrians walkway <coughs> uptown and we can expand on that to make our downtown even better Again, this isn't a discussion item that we, we publish, so we have to be careful how much we talk about it. Yes. Uh, my suggestion was that the uh, library board uh, consider uh, hiring Patrick Mason, the same person that did the landscaping around Emerson, mm -hmm. a and uh, engage, engage him, do a fundraiser if they need to. Uh, this is an item that caused more complaints than anything else since I've been on the council in the last six years. Uh, so, so we know there is a problem out there and there's got to be a solution to it too. <laughs> Let's uh, move on to uh, years of service recognitions if we could. Uh, have you flipped a coin, Chiefs, about who goes first?
Dave Ryerson, Marshtown Fire Department. So it is my, uh, my pleasure today to uh, present to Lieutenant Nick Hannes his 10-year service award. And uh, Nick was the first person that I spoke to in the fire department prior to my coming here to be the chief. And uh, I can always count on an honest opinion from him. And as our union president, he has been, uh, been very agreeable to sitting down with me and discussing matters. And um, we've had a very good working relationship in my time here. And uh, I see no reason why that should change in the future. Nick, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mike Tupper, Marshtown Police Department. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to have Lutre Lieutenant uh, Tricia Tyne here uh, today to celebrate her 15-year work anniversary. So I've uh, had the uh, honor of working with uh, Lieutenant Tyne for about seven years, and here's what I know about her. She's very passionate about her job. She's very passionate about helping people. Um, you've, you've heard me talk about passion and compassion. She serves compassionately every day. Um, very, very bright, very intelligent, one of the best leaders I've ever worked with. I've had the honor of promoting her twice now. She's uh, rose through the ranks very quickly in this police department. And uh, what I've discussed with her uh, for her long-term goals is there's no doubt she could be a captain here. Uh, there's also no doubt in my mind that she could be a police chief, whether it's here or somewhere else. She's very talented, an exceptional public safety professional. So we're very fortunate to have Lieutenant Tyne serving here in the Marshtown community. And I want to congratulate you on 15 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm remiss in my opening remarks that I didn't uh, do a shout out to Chief Tupper for the award that he got last week <laughs> as the top, um, oh, I've forgotten the, the title of it, Ed, executive, top uh, police officer executive in the state of Iowa. Um, you, you do a marvelous job of outreach in this, in this community, and uh, I appreciate what your staff and you do to, to make sure that uh, everybody knows you're here to help. Thank you. At this point, let's go to item F, and I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, call the roll, please. Yeah, um, just a minute. Yes, sir. Um, item number four. Will. I know we I, I I know we got this started before the new 911 system was put in place and the new board was put in place. Will any of these costs be picked up by them in the future? Or are we going to cover the entire cost? Well, the consent agenda. Uh, rather than try to address that, let's just pull it off the consent agenda. I, I think it, it, it's going to take a wider discussion and maybe others that uh, have information would need to be here for it. Okay, but like the uh, the tower, they're going to they're the major user of the tower too, but we're paying for all of it. This this would just go right after the consent agenda on motions where we could talk about it more. Okay. So that would be pulling four through eight, or you just on four. Whatever. Four through eight. It's up to you. Whatever you guys think. Yeah, it, it all relates to the building, so let's pull four through eight. You okay with that amendment? Yes. And is the second okay with that amendment? Yes. Okay. Roll call, please. Gowdy? Yes. Boop? Yes. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. Cahill? Yes. <coughs> Thank you, that has carried. Would you please read the consent agenda items? Sure. Approve council minutes, May 14. Approve bill list in the amount of $7,261,698.62. Approve the April financial statements. Thank you. 
resolution approving a contract for roadway maintenance services at the Iowa Highway 14 from Iowa Avenue to Woodland Street with the IDOT pursuant to Chapter 28E of the Iowa Code and resolution approving a contract for roadway maintenance services at the Iowa Veterans Home created pursuant to Chapter 28E of the Iowa Code. Resolution approving contract change order number one for the 2017 Center Street Bridge over Lynn Creek project an increase of $38,207.67. Resolution approving engineer statement of completion and accepting the Center Street Bridge over Lynn Creek with the final project cost in the amount of $250,647.87. Resolution declaring certain property surplus and authorizing sale and disposal a 2001 Shadow Master enclosed trailer. Approve alcohol license renewals. JB Bar, Walgreens, Hy-Vee Gas, Marshall Beer, Wine, Spirits, Marshall Tobacco and Vape, Midnight Ballroom, Impala Ballroom, Miranchito Mexico, Mexican Grill and Seafood, and El Portal. Okay. Is there a motion to approve all of those items? Oh, all right. Let's let's go to item number four then. Um, items four through eight are all items related to um, equipping the communications center that will be built in the new police and fire building. This is included as part of our budget. I'm going to pull this up on the screen. I can't get them quite all on here. Um, but as you can see, there are uh, um, quite a few different resolutions um, of varying amounts of, of spending. This is all part of our $17.5 million budget. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, there has we have, as a council, have, uh, or as a city, have not made a request for anything to be funded I think the 911 Joint Services Board which Teresa can speak to a little bit more um, is has considered or would be considering um, some financial contribution or to part of this but I would ask Teresa to elaborate more on what that would be hello I'm Teresa Lang I'm the communications manager for the Marshall County 911 Center um, the items that are on your consent agenda were items budgeted for two building projects ago, and um, they haven't changed. Um, they're for radio equipment, towers, antennas that do indeed dispatch for the whole county. Um, the 911 board is paying for other equipment uh, that actually go on the count consoles that we dispatch for the computer equipment the monitors the servers in the back rooms and some of that okay i'd be happy to <coughs> answer, answer any questions you have can we go one more one more question you have. Um, now that we have the new 911 board set up and in operation um, are you going to be covering you know, the, the utility costs and stuff in the new building? Or are we going to, is that a donation from the city? That's still under discussion um, with the new Marshall County Communications Commission and the 911 board. Okay. So that's still an item that, that they're working on. They've worked on an agreement for the existing okay. building, which yeah, that, that agreement yeah. just addresses the yeah. use right. of space. Um, but as far as utilities, um, the current utility costs or like telephone costs for communications operating out mm -hmm. of the basement of the police department, those are billed to the right. 911 surcharge funds at this point. Okay. And so it would not be contemplated that the city would be taking on those costs, that those would again <coughs> be segregated costs. Okay. Correct. This is just for the new building. Okay. The continuing costs of providing 911 service will be, still be paid for by the 911 surcharge. Okay. And that is our telephone bills every month, our, our maintenance bills, our contracts with different software companies, um, the ongoing um, access fees for the radio system. These are simply part of the new build okay okay that answers my question I, I really appreciate it um, just to, I want to make sure I'm on the same page that everybody else is and with that your honor I would move that we approved resolution four through eight as listed is there a second to that motion I'll second 
Any discussion? Any public comment? Roll call, please. Who? Yes. Lamer? Yes. Mark? Yes. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. That has carried on to uh, item number nine. Nope. nope. To the motion. Oh, 15. Sorry. Maybe I should print these out and bring them with me. Approving a new liquor license for the Marshalltown Art Festival, July 21. And along with that would be introducing resolution allowing open containers on public ways for the Marshalltown Art Festival. Is there a motion to approve the license renewals and the um, liquor license for the art festival? So move, Your Honor. I'll second. <coughs> Can those be uh, voted on separately or? If you like, we could. I would. Okay. Let's, uh, is, is our motion to approve just item number 14 about uh, approving the alcohol license renewals? It'd be the motion to do the new liquor license. First. Motion G. What? I'm looking at a different one. Okay. Oh, we did. Yep. Sorry about that. All right. G1, uh, approving new liquor licenses for the festival. Is there a motion to approve that? So move, Your Honor. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Okay, that is carried. Let's go to item H1. Resolution allowing open containers on public ways for the Marshalltown Art Festival. Is there a motion to approve? I move. Is there a second? If there is not a second, then that item will uh, not be approved. Is it, there is somebody here from the art festival. Could they present on that? I would love to have a presentation on that. Amber Danielson, 803 West Main. Uh, I am the director of the Marshall County Arts and Culture Alliance, as well as one of the co-chairs for the art festival. Um, we've been holding an art fair since 1955, and in 2009, the Arts and Culture Alliance um, took over the responsibilities as being the sponsor organization. Uh, the annual art festival, previously known as the Lynn Creek Art Festival, now rebranded as the Marshalltown Art Festival, features over 60 juried artists, performing artists, live music, art activities, food vendors, and a one-of-a-kind raffle prize. The best thing about the festival is that it's completely free and family-friendly. No admission, no parking, two stages playing live music all day, free art, um, youth activities, uh, and so much more. Um, in addition to rebranding the festival in 2018, we'll be changing locations and moving down to the heart of our community in, Marshalltown, or in downtown Marshalltown around the courthouse. Uh, in an effort to support our growing community, the committee, along with the Arts and Culture Alliance, felt a strong need to brand the community of Marshalltown alongside one of its most popular events. In conjunction with Vision Marshalltown, we believe the art festival conveys a sense of community pride. To continue the movement of labeling Marshalltown as the place to live, work, and play, we wanted to be sure that attendees who are traveling to our community leave knowing where they came and have a reason to come back. It's the planning committee's primary goal moving forward to host a high quality art festival in Iowa and showcase the many wonderful offerings of Marshalltown. A vibrant arts and culture environment is critical to economic development. It is key to enhancing quality of life and nurtures a positive view of the community among residents and visitors. Our mission is to um, connect our communities with arts and culture by supporting, promoting, and enriching existing opportunities as well as seeking new possibilities. And we believe a community enriched in arts and culture will attract, retain, and engage our residents. Um, with an approximate attendance, we can confidently figure the economic impact of the art festival. Uh, in 2017, we had over 3,500 attendees, and a study done by the American for the Arts says individuals spend $31.47 per person per event outside of the cost of the festival, so gas or getting lunch. The economic impact of the 27th 
teen festival was over $124,000 to the, the city of Marshalltown. In addition to telling you about the newly rebranded festival, I am obviously here to discuss with you our plan to sell alcohol at the festival. For the first time, the festival would like to sell Iowa craft beers and Iowa native wines. In past years, we have had a craft beer and wine area where we invited festival goers to sample. However, this year we would like for the first time to sell them. Um, we would like to extend this feature of the festival, and I, in your packets included a layout of the festival map, which I'm happy to s put up on the screen if you would like me to. Otherwise, um, I will continue that on Saturday, July 21st, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., the Marshall Art Festival will be taking place in downtown Marshalltown, stretching from Center Street to Second Ave along Main Street, and will be held on the north side of the courthouse grounds. On the northeast side of the courthouse, there will be an enclosed tent where attendees of the age 21 and older would be allowed to purchase Iowa Craft and Iowa Native wines, Iowa Craft beers and Iowa Native wines, and then stroll the festival within the limits of our designated area without being limited to a fenced-in space. All individuals will be ID'd and those 21 and older will be given a bright colored wristband and only those with a wristband will be allowed to go in the enclosed tent. Um, excuse me. Uh, with a wristband then inside, those individuals will have the opportunity to purchase a beverage ticket that will be marked 21 and older and per be invited to purchase craft beer in cans from Confluence and Fire Trucker, both Iowa breweries as well as Iowa native wine from Somerset Winery. Festival volunteers who will be involved in this process from IDing to selling will go through training to assist in the safety of this process. They will be educated on handling the sales of alcohol and identifying and dealing with individuals who choose not to follow the rules. In addition, festival co-chairs have had several meetings with Chief Tupper and Jessica Kenzer uh, to, and other city employees to coordinate the process to ensure the highest safety and success of this. The festival will be paying for four on-site officers who will be scattered among the festival for the entire day, and the festival committee will be taking great measures to ensure significant signage throughout the festival to communicate with festival attendees the rules and limits to which alcohol is permitted. The festival has a very strict ending time of 5 p.m. where alcohol sales will be stopped immediately. And we strongly believe that this extended feature will help continue our goal of providing a high qual quality arts event in our community to attract retain and engage our residents in Marshalltown and continue to um, the movement of labeling Marshalltown as the place to live, work, and play. Any further questions? Any questions? Your Honor, could we see the map? She said sure. she had one. Absolutely. I would like to see that, please. I think I can pull it up in the memo that I... Okay. 58. Mm. Wait, look. can I use this, Jessica? Is that? Yeah, they have to switch back there, otherwise it won't be visible. It's 58, page 58 in today's handout. <coughs> the only one to get the handout. But it's the same page on the website. Mm -hmm. Not when you're doing it with HTML, it doesn't have a page. Oh, oh okay. Okay. This, this map is um, showing us extending to First Street, and we have condensed down <coughs> to just um, Center Street to Second Ave, so we're not going from Center to First Street any longer. Is there an extension north or south except on First Avenue? Is no, that the in only first, spot? Yep, and First Avenue will just be to um, the north side of the courthouse, so um, we won't extend all the way down First Ave. And it that is like the only street. It yep. looked like you had food vendors on correct. First Ave south of yes. Main Street. Yes, correct. Okay. So question, question here. Yes. How many private businesses sell alcohol within that uh, span of three blocks? Two. 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 
at least I, I don't know the exact number, but I can say that we are actively talking to the businesses on Main Street um, who will be affected by the festival and having open conversations with them about our plan for alcohol. We specifically chose uh, the, the breweries that we did because they have very identifiable cans. Um, and so it will be really easy to know because we have no domestic. So, I mean, none of these... None of our downtown businesses sell the beers that we have chosen. So it will be really easy for um, our volunteers and police officers to identify if there's any outside alcohol brought in to these limits. Uh, the chief, uh, could I ask the chief a question? Yeah. If, if, we, if we allow open, open cans, in that area, if somebody brings in their own can, can we stop them? Because we've already said it's, a, it's an area that you can have an open can in. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I could. I think that I, I think it might be difficult for us to not to be argumentative. I want to make it very clear I support their plan. Yeah, yeah. I support what they're doing. Um, I have met with the group once, and I know you've met with Captain Jones at least uh, one other time. So. Um, we're supportive. We think it'll work, but I'm I'm not sure it'll be that easy. But so if if somebody would go into one of those establishments and and buy yeah. one and bring it outside, there really isn't anything we can do about it, right? Probably not. But I'm not really concerned that that's going to be a huge problem. Yeah, I don't know. I just wanted the question answered. Yeah. I yeah. I would say just to kind of elaborate on how this complies with the previous action to approve their liquor license. So for their liquor license, they have to specify a service area, which is the map that we're talking about right now. And so for somebody else to bring in unauthorized alcohol that they are not selling into their service area is a violation that would need to be stopped so because that would be a violation of their liquor license so that's where if the police department um, can't assist in that right of way they certainly would have an obligation to stop um, alcohol that they are not selling from coming into an area that they've identified as their service area if that makes sense that makes sense it, so basically they can't have author an alcohol that they're not selling in a place that they've said this is where we're selling alcohol well, they, they wouldn't have it no. If I walked into that corner, into the corner up here, uh, grocery store, I could buy a can of beer there and walk outside. And if we say this area is okay to have an open can, what are you going to do to them? You can't do anything to them. It, they can have an open can but, there. But we what said they I, could. I think what the difference is is about the city versus the Marshalltown Art Festival, which is they have multiple volunteers who will be walking around that it's their obligation to say, sorry, this is our service area. You cannot have that um, alcohol here because we did not sell it. N Neil, did you want to reply to that? Thank you, Neil. Uh, Neil DeLal. I live at 1504 Brentwood Terrace. Uh, I spent eight years in the beer business, so I've I've worked a time or two at beer events, but say if somebody were to go into one of these stores and buy a, a can of Coors Light and we don't sell Coors Light, we will automatically know that that doesn't belong there. So we will train our staff, our volunteers, to immediately spot a, a can like that, Coors Light, Bud Light, Budweiser, Corona, and then have them remove them off the premises, throw it away, they can leave. Or we can also, also have the uh, Marshtown Police I don't think do that he, same thing too. He said he, <clears throat> he said he can't. If we give a have a, if that's an open can area, he can't. That's a violation of our license. So if Iowa alcohol wanted to come in and revoke it, I think we're getting off into two different discussions. So they can certainly ask somebody to leave their area. Yep. Okay. If they're bringing in alcohol from uh, that they haven't sold, they can do that. Okay. Uh, but we are in, essentially saying it's okay to drink beer in this area. And I'm not going to get into the gotcha. logistical argument. I'm not concerned. I think that this event is going to work. I'm not concerned at all. I don't have any concerns. Okay. Okay. I would also point out that the resolution granting the exception grants it to the Marshalltown Art Festival doesn't just say that this is an area where from these hours to these hours anybody in the public can be drinking whatever they want to in this area. And so it's very much tied in, the language of the resolution is very much tied into the specific event at hand. And then so somebody that not having a wristband or those cans would be asked to leave. Under those circumstances, <clears throat> I would move to approve that resolution again. Um, 
and we'll try it this one time and see if it works. If it works, great, good. If I'm it doesn't work. I'm going to consider your motion to be a second to the motion already made. Oh, okay. With your permission. That's fine. Any discussion or questions? Uh, thank you. Part of uh, Marshtown Art Festival, this, this worked out great for uh, Octemberfest, so I think it'll work out great for us, too. Okay. It, it's one heck of a festival. It really is. I, I think it's cool it's being moved up to our beautiful courthouse, too. It'd be interesting to see. It brings in artists from all over the country. Your Honor, I would I would second that as well. It is a wonderful event. The fact that the hours are from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. specifically, um, I think that limits the um, the habitual drinking or the drinking of multiple multiple, especially if it's a big hot day. But um, they, I think that our our situation is um, good that again you have said your the training of your volunteers and your staff. I think that the possibility of of things not going as intended are very limited. Thank you. Other comments or questions? <coughs> Roll call, please. Lamer? <coughs> yep, I think he didn't hear. Lamer? Me? Yes. Martin? Yes. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? No. Carried. Thank you. Would you read the next uh, resolution, please? Resolution of support and financial commitment for the Marshalltown, Iowa Main Street program. It, is there a motion to approve the resolution? So move, Your Honor. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? Please come forward. Good afternoon, everyone. Nate McCormick, 1904 Bailey Drive, also the president of the Marshtown Central Business District. Um, just wanted to make a couple of very brief comments since we're, uh, we're I'm sure, short on time over lunch. But uh, Jenny had a uh, had a family medical emergency, so I'm going to pinch it for her here um, uh, to this afternoon. So. Um, this resolution, uh, you know, is a uh, is something that we're required to do as as uh, the central business district in Marshalltown is part of a larger program of Main Street communities throughout uh, the nation and throughout Iowa. Um, the main those Main Street communities consider the partnerships with the cities involved to be so critical that uh, as part of our accreditation each year, we're required to come before the city council and uh, request support uh, both. Um, in principle and financially from the cities in which uh, in which we have uh, operations. Um, certainly the previous support of the city has been critical to the success of the Marshtown Central Business District and uh, in all the projects and programs that, uh, that we've successfully completed over the years. Um, the, uh, the impact on the city of Marshalltown is tremendous. Um, everything from things like the pedestrian walkway, the, uh, the flower baskets, um, the renovations of the, uh, the Kibbe building, Tallcorn Towers, McGregor's, um, these would not have been possible without the, uh, the incredible support of the city and uh, the support of our Main Street, Iowa and National Main Street programs. Um, you know, the, the investment made uh, just out of the challenge grants, over $175,000 into Marshalltown. Uh, the, the personal dollars invested as, uh, as parts of those grants and matching programs uh, has exceeded $11 million in Marshalltown, which is really, truly tremendous. So, um, you know, the, uh, this partnership's really critical to, to our success, to the success of Marshalltown, and to the, uh, the future success and, and growth and beautification of our downtown. Any questions? Would you remind me how much this is again? Uh, it's so 24500 I believe. Um, right? for, for the fiscal year that starts July 1st, it's 26000 and that's just a one-year agreement. So before um, December 1st of 2018, we'll need to come up with an agreement for the next year. And this particular resolution does not specify a dollar amount. This is, this is really a, a resolution of support from the city, again, to maintain our, our accreditation as a, a Main Street program. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. We have one. Yeah, we had one already. <laughs> Boy, I need more coffee today. <laughs> and we've had a second. Yep. Okay. Any public comment? Or any any uh, comments received from the public? No, Your Honor. Okay. Roll call. Martin. Yes. Kale. Yes. Gowdy. Yes. Hoop. Yes. Lamer? Yes. Carried. Thank you. 
Madam Secretary, please read the next resolution. Resolution authorizing the application and acceptance of, of grant, if awarded, of a Martha Ellen Ty Foundation grant for the Iowa River Trail Master Plan Project. I guess we could call for a motion first. I move that we pass this. Is there a second? Our seconds are slow today. Second. We do better at night. Uh, Need Michelle. more coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Michelle Sponheimer, Housing Community Development Director. Uh, just kind of these next two resolutions do somewhat go together. And so just so I don't repeat, I'm, I'm kind of talking about both of them except for, for different organizations. I uh, wanted to start out by just um, kind of backing up a little bit. Previously at a council meeting, we had a resolution to accept a grant award from the National Endowment for the Arts, Our Town program uh, if awarded. Uh, we had that before the official announcement was made on May 9th, which uh, indicated that we were selected uh, as a grantee uh, to receive $25,000 uh, from the NEA specifically for the Our Town Grant Program. That grant uh, was um, intended or is intended to conduct a master plan for the Iowa River Trail, specifically addressing things like wayfinding, uh, branding, uh, public art inclusion, uh, even trailhead development uh, to some extent as it kind of uh, fits in with that, with that overall theme. And the 25,000 NEA award does have to be matched dollar for dollar. And we have those committed funds, uh, 5,000 of which the council pledged when we applied way back in September. Uh, you had committed $5,000 to go towards that uh, application should we be successful. And then the additional 20,000 is coming uh, from the trails organizations uh, in some fashion, whether it be direct from the Hardin County Trail Commission or Trails Incorporated or their joint account funds, which certainly maybe uh, Mayor can speak a little bit more to than even I can uh, and how those operate. But they're, they do have uh, a way to bring bring together that additional matching funds uh, to support the NEA required match dollars. So that would bring us to our $50,000, what I'll call kind of a base amount. Originally, when we applied for the National Endowment for the Arts, we had applied for $50,000, uh, hoping to have a total $100,000 <coughs> project. So when we received only $25,000, um, you know, that, that brought down our match amount. Um, but we still have a large uh, contingency of those partners that would like to um, still operate and get that goal of 100000 because I think that would provide us with the best opportunities to get a plan that we're looking for. So we're looking for other alternatives to find more money. We're not here asking uh, the council to uh, bring forward more money, uh, but to authorize staff to apply for additional grants. Uh, to get us up to that $100,000 mark. So uh, the two resolutions I have before you, one is for the Martha Ellen Tai Foundation. Uh, we would be looking to request up to $50,000 from them uh, with the hope that we are able to secure some other grants and don't need to go after a full $50,000. Uh, we have an application um, that will be uh, putting forward to the Wellmark Foundation, a small match grant program, which is a maximum award of, of 25,000. So for example, if we're able to get that grant uh, for 25, then we would be looking to the Thai Foundation for 25 instead of the 50 to get us up to that full 100. We're also communicating with um, Region 6 Planning Commission and the Iowa DOT to maybe utilize planning grant dollars uh, transportation planning grant dollars, similar to what we used for the Highway 14 study that we'll be, of course, hearing more about today. So if, you know, we've got a couple of different opportunities uh, that if one or two or all three were to come together, we would be able to uh, maximize that award amount to get up to a $100,000 goal uh, and, and really take a good look at that whole trail area and come up with some wonderful ideas for the future as trail develops. So this is a plan project. It's not a construction project. It's not to actually implement uh, public art 
building uh, or commissioning of work or put in signs. This is a, this is a planning uh, project where we will be able to come up with that overall branding and theme to carry out throughout the 34 mile trail so that as projects move and trail gets built and communities start trailheads and other um, activities, they have a tool to use and a guide to use for what to develop and how it should look. And so that's what we're excited about. Um, the NEA, our town program, is very heavily focused on community engagement. Uh, so that it will be a big piece of this project. And it's not just our residents here in Marshalltown. We would be the grants, we are the grantee. Um, but as this is a 34 mile stretch, it's very important to hit all of those communities along that trail and encourage that participation with those folks. And so we want each of these areas to have their own unique character. We want that to be maintained um, throughout the trail, yet having a kind of a unified uh, presence that you know you're on the Iowa River Trail, no matter which point in that 35 miles you are at. And so we're working with all those groups together. It's going to be a big uh, committee group and a lot of people to pull together. Um, but we've had some preliminary meetings. And uh, I think everybody is real excited for the opportunity to do this uh, and to really put together something that can be used by all of those groups as that trail develops over the next several years. So the first resolution you have uh, before you is for the Martha and Ty Foundation for up to a $50,000 uh, grant award. The second resolution you'll have on your agenda is for the Wellmark Foundation for $25,000. Uh, so we hope to be able to secure them. The Wellmark Foundation, one we would not know until December, which is uh, part of um, why we are looking at multiple opportunities for funding. The NEA award would start August 1st is the term of the grant and run through July 31st of 2019. So this is a project that will actually take place during the next fiscal year. That, thanks questions? Michelle. And I have to give a shout out to Marty Wymore and you and Kim Scriver as the three main grant writers. We've, we've raised over four million dollars so far and we're going to be paving out to the um, the next, uh, is it Hightower Road? I've forgotten the name of the radio, yes. radio Tower Road. Thank you. Uh, this next summer, and now we're trying to do the fundraising to get up to Albion the next year after that. And at the Wednesday meeting of the Trails Inc. board last week, uh, they were pretty excited about this arts grant. Any other questions or discussion? Michelle, when we talk about <coughs> matches, mm -hmm. and uh, that comes from the city of Marshalltown. What funds specifically are we talking about when we do our match? Because we're getting into some numbers here, which I support, but where is it coming from? I believe, and Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the 5000 the 5000 is what the city committed to match out of the total budget. Um, and I believe that's coming from the local option sales tax, which what was agreed upon at when the resolution was passed back in probably August, actually. Okay. Furthermore, it's my understanding that when Trails Inc. and the city council got together, it was via 28E agreements. I've come to understand that uh, each project needs approval from the council from any matches that we might do. Is that correct? Am I stating that correct even? I'm going to defer that to Jessica. It, I would say it, <clears throat> it depends. Um, we are the fiduciary agent for any of the state or federal funding that comes through. And so that doesn't require a separate agreement. But if you were to, as a city council, be putting forth funding that we didn't have budgeted for a, a project or a partnership with Trails Inc., that would come forward back to you or that would come back to you for a separate approval. Okay, I'm just offering out off the top of my head what constituents and citizens have, have said. There are a number of things that we've got ongoing, planned, and they all tie into the making Marshalltown a better place to live, work, and play, to recreate, and so on. Um, some of them we don't know the final or anything even approaching a final cost, and I'm talking about what do we do in addition to the Highway 14 Center Street corridor? Um, how far do we go with improvements to the municipal airport? 
what do we do when we have 60 homes plus not connected with uh, with just one egress and one in egress ingress um, coming to mind are some other electrical very serious electrical updates needed to the uh, Riverview Park I'm just cautioning all of us to look at these things and not go overboard but I'm very supportive of the mm -hmm. trails and yeah, what, think, what you've accomplished with the grant writing and with the with the many donors that are that are specific to this project. Cer certainly, I think you know this is an example of how leveraging funds is so important. Um, you know, with with the essentially a five thousand dollar investment from the city, we could be looking at ninety five thousand additional dollars coming into this project from other sources. Uh, you know, with the NEA grant we are one of 60 in the country and that's something to be very proud of uh, the only one to receive the funding in the state um, so you know the uh, federal organization uh, that granted that saw the value in this project and what it can do for our communities um, and I, I continue to support that and I hope that all the projects are looked at in that fashion and they are all individual things that do need to be considered. But I think that shows how we leverage resources to make those dollars go farther when there are limited limited resources available. Special congratulations to you and the team on the NEA grant. I know that's very difficult having been in the capacity of a Red Cross grant writer. So again, that's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. May I ask, uh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Mr. Lamer. I was just going to mention that um, I was having a little trouble with the funding process, but I, I now understand, I think, better all that. A lot of the grants that, that the bike trail is asking for um, can't go to the bike trail. It has to come to us. So that's why we have to approve all of these is because they need, they need somebody who takes care of the, the cash disbursements and that in their eyes that's a city um, so it isn't as though we are we're going to apply for money that we're going to we're going to put a match to or anything it's just that we're we're the guy that they all look to for the money to come to and then we'll disperse it so I I understand that all now a lot of, a lot better thank you sir Ms. Gale you um, specifically mentioned that this is for the planning aspect of the grant and the um, continuation the the construction and maintenance of the trail what are the estimates for that down the road as far as the city's portion of that um you know that's certainly something i can't answer uh to be honest i i you know have been learning a lot about the trail stuff in the because I haven't been involved with from the beginning but I'm sure there are many different components of the trail that require different things and how that's being handled what the trails groups are doing or fundraising for what federal funds or state funds are maybe paying for versus what uh, you know individual owners maybe are are doing um, I'm sure varies throughout that 34 mile stretch perhaps um, and so that's something that I would assume and please Feel free to jump in if you I, have that. I was going to say, I think, you know, what would be best, because there is a lot of conversation here, is that at some point we do like a special work session or something where we have Trails Inc. here and have some conversation about what our existing agreements are and what our future commitments are as fiduciary agent and now, you know, with this grant as well. Um, and that that would hopefully be able to get all of your questions answered about those larger maintenance yeah. and funding issues. Great idea. That would be a good. great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, as, as we met kind of in as a starting committee, this is a question that kind of comes up because it's hard to separate sometimes. And so a lot of the conversation I've been having with even some of the traumas is talking about that, how, you know, looking at this, this is this particular project associated with that planning effort, some of those branding and the theme. And, it, and it's not going to get into some of the details of who's maintaining or who's building or who's, you know, doing those things. This is really about kind of mm -hmm. that uh, branding of that trail and in the introduction of public art to the process uh, and opportunities. So sometimes hard to separate and pull ourselves away from the overall big picture. Uh, and so I, I think that, yeah, informational meeting would probably be helpful. Has that program study been priced yet? 
I mean, we're raising 100000 is that? The intention would be that the full budget would, would go towards the consultant to do that work, right? So this, this all funding raise would be going direct to um, hire the consultant to do that uh, full plan, that full master plan. So none of this would be going towards any implementation or, or staffing or anything of that nature. If we are unable to secure some of the other uh, grants that are mm -hmm. there, are we looking at a $50,000 $50, consultant um, plan rather than a $100,000 plan? Correct, right. And we have outlined, uh, initially our thoughts are that in that scope, that request for qualifications that would go out, we may even see it as kind of a phased approach since we won't know about like the Wellmark Foundation until December, uh, is that the, the first, what I'll call kind of a three-tier um, look is the first tier will be kind of an overall branding uh, and looking at wayfinding and signage and some theme uh, type component. Uh, second, you know, talking about uh, identifying maybe certain areas that would be ideal for public art inclusion or trailhead location. And then that third phase, which allows for if we are able to secure the full funding to really get into more of conceptual design for a few of those areas. So picking one or two or three uh, sections along the trail and really getting a little bit more, not full engineer drawings, um, we're not talking about construction drawings and engineer drawings, but more of conceptual development for, you know, maybe this trailhead or this bridge that's going to include public art or, you know, this nature area, whatever it might be. So as we are able to secure additional funding, that's a component that we could add to that scope of work with the consultant to refine some of those plans for some of those areas. So ideally, kind of thinking of it as a large umbrella first, we want to get the overall theme that can be carried out throughout the entire trail, and then narrowing it down as our funding allows. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Or public comment? Hi, Lee Botter, 401 Orchard Drive. Um, I am the co-founder of Splice for Life, as you guys know, and I think it's um, very important this week being Memorial Day weekend just to honor the four children that lost their lives in the Iowa River. And uh, with that situation, um, I'm going to give a shout out, first of all, to Linehan Ricochet Club. Last week, we were awarded $500 towards the uh, build for the splash pad, and we continue in that. Going hand in hand with this particular resolution, uh, we did submit requests from city administrator and uh, handed out to council. Uh, also support in helping write grants uh, for the splash pad. It can be a small one, it can be a large one, whatever the case may be. But going hand in hand with this, I'd like the signage to take a little more than just a conceptual. And what we'd like to uh, request is that we are working hand in hand with Trails Inc., with the city, on uh, developing that signage. We have some very creative ideas for um, art along the trails, things to bring water to the trails, which would be very instrumental for um, everything. And the other thing that we'd like to request is that there is consideration that there are signage put up along the river and there may be some legal issues with this that we work on, but we have checked into the DNR situation on putting some signage out there to try to discourage swimming within the river. So it would go hand in hand with this signage situation that we're looking at. Um, I will commit on behalf of um, our committee, our board is met, and we would like to donate $1,000 towards the project in order to put signage out against the river for those river. Um, and we will be more than happy to work with the city on that. But I am committing publicly that we are committing $1,000 to get signs out to that river. I don't want another child drowning this summer. And I would assume that you'd be in agreement with that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Let's call the roll. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. It has carried. Uh, Let's go on to the next resolution, please. Resolution authorizing the application and acceptance, if it granted, of a Wellmark Foundation grant for the Iowa River Trail Master Plan Project. Move to approve. I'll second. Any discussion? Roll call. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. And that is carried as well. 
We're up to uh, item number five, which is a public hearing. So I'll declare the public hearing uh, um, open at uh, 1255. Have we received any uh, written comments? I have not received any written comments. Any public comments? Is there any staff review about the um, urban renewal area number two? I'll just make some quick comments. You have the, the plan as, as part of your packet yeah, that this is an amendment to our east side um, urban five. renewal area to add in um, possible public improvement com uh, public improvements. Um, this in no way commits the city to actually complete those projects but provides you um, with a possible funding source of tax increment financing should you proceed with those projects and with that funding source. And, and back to written comments received by the clerk. I, I believe there was a letter received. Yes, from the county, I thought. Yes, from the county Huge supervisor. Letter. Thank you. And so that should be part of the public record. Any comments by the council? Did we respond to the county? Yes, um, and I believe I sent that response to all of you as well. Um, just uh, the 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 question, the biggest question that was asked um, was would the would the council ever consider partnering a development agreement with uh, where we were taking on infrastructure needs as well? Um, in any sort of development, that's hard to comment on, especially at this point when there is no bird in hand or anything at this point where um, where there's something to contemplate. And so I just said that would be up ultimately up to council discretion as to whether or not that would be something that you would choose to do in the future okay thank you and both the written comment from the county and the response are in the packet thank you mr. mayor I'd just like to say that all of us as city councilors are of the understanding that working with TIF that it is not a productive means when it's considered for tax exempt properties and i think we're very strong on that we've got to keep reminding ourselves that it's a, a progressive thing and we're looking for investment we're looking for progress or we're looking to work with private uh, investors so um, that's an important concept that we need to keep in mind i believe thank you any other consular comments I would be concerned that this is a large item and a very important item and we don't have a full council here so I would be concerned that, that maybe this should wait till we have a full council any other comments or suggestions Let's uh, declare the public hearing is closed now at uh, 12.58 p.m. Is there a motion to approve or to uh, table? Your Honor, in, as requested by Mr. Hoop, I would move that we table this item until our next council meeting and then take a vote on it when all the councilors are present. Is there a second to the motion to table? Second. I don't believe this one's debatable, but in case I'm wrong, is there any further discussion? Good. Let's uh, call the roll. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. Cahill? Yes. It is on the table. Thank you. Uh, would you read the next uh, item, which is now in ordinances? Um, we have a public hearing oh, regarding sorry, the budget amendment. Yep. For this fiscal year. I'm sorry, I missed that. So we're at item um, I-2, and I'll declare that meeting uh, the public hearing open at uh, 11, at 1, geez, 12.58, sorry. Get, get used to my digital watch. Um, have we received any written comments to the clerk's office? I have not received any written comments. Are there any public comments? Staff review? Diana Steiner, Finance Director. As discussed with you at prior council meeting, changes are needed to stay within the budget this fiscal year. There is no impact to property tax levy. 
the total change of 32,450 is being funded with lost local option sales tax money, which you have already approved. Are there any questions? Hearing none, uh, let's declare the public hearing closed at um, 11.59. Is there a motion to approve the uh, amendment? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Hoop? Yes. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. And it has carried, thank you. Uh, now down to ordinances. Item I-1, would you read that please, Madam Clerk? This is the first reading of ordinance amending Chapter 26 streets and sidewalks, Article 3 by repealing current language and adopting new language. Is there a motion to approve? So move, Your Honor. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion. Um, this does take into consideration the comments that you provided from our last discussion, um, as well as then I think there was one cross reference that I found uh, with another ordinance um, related to barricading of sidewalks um, or barricading of right of way when there is some a contractor doing work in the right of way. And so uh, what we have here is a, a final pr proposed ordinance for a first reading. Thank you. Public comment. RV Varnum, 1302 South 6th Street. I wonder if there's something shady going on with this ordinance. One part I read in there had a sign out on the street there that's going to propose a sidewalk. And I called up here and he says, well, that's going to be put on hold. What well, was it, a couple of meetings ago he was talking about a trail ride, or not trail ride, but a bike ride, cart path up to the Legion, bypassing the, the golf course and the bowling alley up to the Legion. And then what I read in the paper, you want to tie a sidewalk in with a bike path. Is that correct? Now, we got sidewalks in nowhere all over Marshalltown. And I just wonder if we're bailing this dude developer out for, uh, he gets a sidewalk put in the cart path where the property tax owners pay for it, and he won't have to put a sidewalk here on 6th Street. Now, I know there's property up there just south of Bowling Alley that's, uh, not in, that hasn't been sold yet. But if this ordinance passes through, then he buys that ordinance, and so what he'll get out of building a sidewalk on 6th Street, and the taxpayers will have to pay for the sidewalk they put on the bike pass, the way I understand it. I asked Councilman Gowdy, I says, if you, is he supporting the Legion or the taxpayers, and I never got a call back. Mm. So I'm assuming, I know Mike is pretty active in the Legion, so. If that ever comes up to vote, I think Mike ought to do the honorable thing and not vote on it. Thank you. Um, to clarify, oh, go ahead. Wasn't that, wasn't that sign out there because he was requesting, because of the topo of the ground, the difference to build a sidewalk there, he was asking for a waiver on the sidewalk? Yes. yes. Let's that's yeah, what if you, if I may, <laughs> I'll address that. Michelle Sponheimer, um, the request that was before the Board of Adjustment uh, was for a sidewalk deferment. Mm -hmm. uh, what a deferment is, uh, is just a delay of installation of a sidewalk. If at any point the city determines a sidewalk should be installed at a given location that's been deferred, it is the property owner's uh, cost to bear to install that sidewalk and to do it in a, a time uh, as requested. So that um, request to defer the sidewalk on 6th Street was approved by the Board of Adjustment. Uh, and again, if at some point uh, the city determines that a sidewalk should be installed along that uh, portion of 6th Street, that would be the owner's expense to do so, and he has an uh, understanding of that. So the they did look at the topography and those kind of things as part of that consideration by the board approval. The ordinance um, still includes a deferment process uh, in it, the ordinance before you. Uh, however, it does change it from going through the board review to an administrative review. Uh, and so the uh, myself and city engineer are able to look at each situation that's a deferment request, uh, take into consideration those type of uh, 
circumstances such as topography um, and make a decision. The same would hold true that if at any point in the future uh, deferment uh, is called upon that the owner would be responsible for uh, installing a sidewalk. It would not be the responsibility of the taxpayers. And, and just to clarify, the, the one change in the ordinance for deferral or deferments, how it exists now to how it is, is the administrative review, but with an appeal to the council. Correct. Currently, none of these deferments come to you at all. Um, this would put you as the final say on whether or not a sidewalk should be installed. The, yes, sir. the one issue that I brought up at the last meeting hasn't been changed. I, our city engineer can comment on that. Good. Uh, Councilor Lambert, if you read that, uh, let me find it exactly. It's number article, seven. Yes. <laughs> it uh, reads that if the sidewalk is contiguous with the curb right up adjacent to the curb, that it shall be at the same elevation. But then the second half of that statement says that if there are, is space between the curb and the sidewalk, the sidewalk shall be elevated at a half an inch per foot of distance. So if it's four feet away, the sidewalk would be two inches above the curb line. So it covers whether it's adjacent to the curb or whether there's a green space or a, a space in between the curb and the sidewalk. It's, it's appropriate. What happened to our six inch? Uh, it's I, been six inches in this town ever since the town was I founded. I can go and look at the last one. <laughs> uh, I can't guarantee you that that's not the case, but I don't believe that is the case. Well, 30 years we replaced them when we messed them up over at the waterworks and you always made us put them in six inches high. You didn't. I never got the joy of making <laughs> you repair You something. didn't. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> we were always required to put them in six inches above and I still think six it, the six inch thing should be a minimum because be you got enough elevation and it's your responsibility and not yours. It's the city's responsibility to control all the water between the two property loans. I like and a half inch per and that difference. way that way you have full control of that water yep it's okay. appropriate in my opinion okay so when i put my new driveway in this year i don't have to put it as high do i i can put it down lower <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey guys it'll be six inches you watch <laughs> you're out of order again <laughs> <laughs> any other questions let's call the roll Lamer? Yes. Warren? <laughs> Martin? Yes. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? No. It has carried and on to the last ordinance, number two. Would you read that item, please? This is the first reading of an ordinance to amend the Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 20, Section 2169, prohibiting parking when snow removal operations are in progress. And it also addresses parking on 4th Street, so I need to change my title. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Any second? Second. Uh, Discussion. So what is it we're doing here? This, yeah. These were um, so actually these were changes that were identified by council members Gowdy and Hoop related to um, a parking or a pickup and drop off area around Pleasant View, and then I believe uh, a snow removal area on Seventh Avenue, Fifth, 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 Avenue. Fifth Avenue. And so I don't know if you'd like to speak more about those, or. So we're this is to remove the signs, or is this going to leave going to remove them? Yes, those those specific things were stated specifically within our ordinance um, in the in the sections. And so in order to make any changes related to the the pickup and drop off zones and where, um, you know, snow removal uh, restrictions are, you have to then remove those addresses or those locations from our code of ordinances. OK, that was that was the reason for that is uh, Fisher School. Uh, because of that limitation on alternate parking uh, if you go down there when when schools let out there's a lot of uh, children that are uh, running around on the sidewalks and the parents are going around in a circle waiting for their children and this is for a one block area on on 4th Street from Sunset to Pleasant View to be able to park on both sides of the street uh, there's only one uh, driveway there so 
it's not really a, I think that was a kind of a blanket thing when they were put in. And it's just, uh, I would rather see parking on both sides when, when the school's in session or when it's let out and because of the children waiting for their parent or guardian or whoever to pick them up and instead of looking for them, uh, they can stay on the sidewalk and not cross. And I just thought it was, it was uh, safety reasons to remove that, those two signs. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? My question is, does this appear, um, as, as it reads, it talks about prohibited at all times except as provided by the Section 20. Um, so I am confused on how this affects non-school time. Can you please um, share that with me? <laughs> Someone. <laughs> Um, it, it goes back to what's not stated in the ordinance. Um, that exception uh, is that 20-162.1, and let me pull up my code of ordinances here. I think Unless I have a, Justin can speak to this. As you ask me, I, I have it written down I think somewhere. I have it here too. Temporary stops for the sole purposes of immediate discharge or immediate loading of students shall be permitted, but only in the event that off-street areas for such discharge or loading do not exist within 300 feet of any exit door of said school. Any such temporary stop shall be for a duration of the shortest possible time necessary to discharge or load students shall be done in a matter that will not impede or hamper general traffic and the driver shall remain in the vehicle. Okay, thank you for reading that. So by removing the area on um, Pleasant View to Sunset, uh, or South 4th Street between Pleasant View and Sunset um, makes it so that all times there can be basically parking there. Um, and I think that was the intention that uh -huh. Council Member Gowdy was trying to get at. So it's not just a school pick up and drop off for temporary, that it's at all times that that parking would be available. And the same issue applies at the other schools. And you're, you are saying that it's for the safety at all schools that there can be parking on both sides. In this particular instance, there, there, uh, the only need for it would be during the, the uh, loading and unloading or the uh, start of school and the end of the school. That being said, uh, unless you want to write the ordinance to allow parking on just one side when the school is not in session I think that's a futile attempt of putting signs up and down and uh, I didn't think that was it was uh, a great amount of uh, energy to to do that because of the simple fact that it's for a one block area your honor yes sir pretty concerned about the high traffic high volume of traffic meaning people traffic first of all and I'm thinking if it's not wide enough you've got parking on both sides you've got people darting between cars I, I'm I'm apprehensive of this I don't have a solution I'm sorry that was my best solution I could come up with without a, a vehicles driving around and around on Bringleson and and 4th Street uh, and Sunset to pick up their their children uh, I think we're talking a uh, a great amount of children. I, I'm not sure exactly how many pe uh, children go to the Fisher School, but uh, that was an idea that I thought would probably cure that. Uh, I believe we went through the same thing on the south side of Fisher School, uh, which was not allowed, and they had to uh, install a, a, a pickup lane, if you, per se and you get into something like that then uh, if you go by there when school gets out you'll notice that that whole lane is full probably an hour to an hour and a half before school gets out for the simple fact that there's so many people that don't ride the buses anymore they bring their children and it's, uh, you can see the the same effect that Lenahan. If you've ever been down by there when when they let out school, 
there's there's a few buses and most of them are pedestrian uh, walking or children walking to to their vehicles which is not a great concern because on the north side usually it's two lanes of pickup and and uh, one lane going the other way because nobody really bothers to stay in line they just go and pick up children and so it, it's a concern and it's also a concern to, that, that I brought up uh, a, a signal on on uh, Engledu and 6th Street uh, if you've ever tried to be down in that area when school gets out it's it, it's a mess there it's also a mess on on uh, South Street High Street uh, there's just a tremendous amount of people driving and picking up their children now instead of the busways. Uh, I'm not sure what that reasoning is, but. Um, one of the things where uh, I would leave this up to your discretion, I can't pull it up on the map because I don't have the keyboard back here, um, but this is an area that's just to the south of um, Fisher Elementary, kind of the southeast. And uh, there is currently only sidewalk on one side of the road. Part of what will be coming forward to you on June 11th or sometime in June related to filling of the gaps is a lot of work in this area, including on the opposite side of the South 4th Street between Pleasant View and Sunset, which we're talking about adding an additional sidewalk so that you would be able, so that for that crosswalk right now, um, which basically has cro a crosswalk across uh, you know, four sides of that intersection of Pleasant View and South 4th Street would then have people able to go north and south on both sides of the street. And I can't remember, I think uh, the proposed gap stuff does have something going further on Pleasant View as well. And so if this is of concern to you now, um, we will soon be discussing, uh, you know, possible sidewalk gaps in that area that we could certainly tie in this conversation to that as well. Have we uh, made contact and ongoing contact with the school district and the school? Um, yes. Yeah, so there was uh, this spring, um, myself and uh, Justin Nickel went out um, and met on site with the principal there and had some discussions, including um, more information about, you know, gaps that were identified back in 2007, yeah. 2008, as well as then um, this gap between South Fort or on South Fourth between Pleasant View and Sunset. And then the police department has done a, a great amount of engagement out there to try and do the best as possible with them. Um, people blatantly avoiding uh, driving regulations and parking regulations and creating unsafe situations. So there's there's been, and that's not just at Fisher Elementary with the police department, that's at all the elementary schools. And so there's there's been an ongoing discussion, but specifically in this area, I can foreshadow for you that with the sidewalk gap information, there were a number of sidewalks in this area that weren't completed back in 2008. And then there's some additions as well to continue to make things through. Other questions or comments? Let's call the roll. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Carried on to item J, which is discussion. And the first item is about the senior citizens building. Yes, um, I uh, included quite a bit of information in your packet on the senior um, citizens building. Um, to give you an idea, we currently have two renters there. Uh, the first level is occupied by the um, Senior Center of, or Marshall County Senior Center, and the uh, upper level is occupied by the Northeast, I Northeast, Northeast Iowa Area Agency on Aging. Um, both of them, uh, well, I shouldn't say both of them have leases. Currently, only the, the downstairs occupants have a lease, which they have requested to renew for two years. Um, as part of the budget process, uh, and knowing that backfill could, could be a possibility, um, Diana Steiner and I had been looking at things, and um, the Senior Citizens Building is one of those items which had come up and um, was one where we were we were budgeting in the fiscal year to start July 1st, we were budgeting that that building was going to cost us $30,000 above and beyond the rent. And so um, what I, uh, then Mayor Greer and I had a meeting with some of the representatives from the uh, Marshall County S Senior Center to have a conversation about long-term operations and ultimately 
um, what I would like to propose to you as a, a closure of that building at some point. Um, I would prefer sooner because the, the more money that we, we are spending, the more money that is not to go towards um, some other operation or whatever you would direct it to. Um, but the date that they uh, had put out there was December 31st of 2019. And so um, what I would uh, request before you today is that we um, move forward or that there be a motion to move forward uh, to direct me to work on leases with both tenants um, for the rent that they are paying, which is currently $400 a month um, through December 30th of 2019 or in, until they, they basically can vacate the premises, um, whichever comes sooner. Your Honor, I have a question. Do we supplement the programming for those or we truly just own the building and we are renting it to these two, serve, two um, organizations? It is, it's the latter that you said there, that we are, we are a landlord and they are our tenant, and um, that's, that's the arrangement that we have. Thank I, you. I believe from having served on the board upstairs that has basically disbanded, we haven't had a meeting in two years, uh, the city does do some things like helping on, on the upkeep. Uh, they, they've helped repair some things in the past. Um, mm -hmm. But... Uh, Just what... Uh, and the downstairs folks that we met with, uh, they they could actually either increase the rent or uh, they have a fund available to them if they need to move someplace else. And so they're they're looking at their options there. We know that when the Coliseum is done, that might be a logical place f for the seniors to uh, to attend. As I understand it from visiting with them, they've been dropping in usage numbers it over the years. We, in, in our conversation, you know, this is not something where we just want to kick, kick them out on the street, which is why the, the longer timeline, but also um, if there's anything we could do to assist in providing them another location. Um, but at, at this point, I would recommend that we not get into a, a, a long-term landlord-tenant situation. Is there a motion to uh, direct staff to continue to look at the leases? Can I make a comment first? You bet. I'd like to make one, too. Uh, I think before we boot them out on the curb, <coughs> I think we need to help them or find a place. The Coliseum would be great, but I don't know the future of that renovation. But it uh, seems like everything we're doing in the city right now is geared towards younger people and drawing people in and giving them things to do. There are uh, <coughs> there are some folks out there that they're kind of my age that that really use that place and it gives them something to do each day and I think we we have to make sure that we have a place like that somewhere so I'd be a little a little area of pushing real hard and I understand the cost problem but you might want to compare it to our aquatic center that loses a lot of money every year and we just keep funding and pushing that. And uh, I think the elderly people, I hate to use the word elderly, the guys my age or ladies need somewhere to be. Um, I agree with you completely, and that's why we offered up some potential. The timeline for a Coliseum renovation is something that's going to be problematic with the 2019 date. Um, the, the bigger picture of why December 31st, 2019 also makes sense is because in 2020, we have some ADA compliance issues to meet where we'd have to be installing a new elevator. And so I'd like you to think of this as we're closing that building. The request is to close that building as of December 31st, 2019, but we will do what we we can to help them find a different location by that time um, but this is essentially a conversation about do you want to start investing money in that building to make it code compliant and to address the our as you saw in the budget there our biggest issues are energy issues we're spending more on natural gas and electricity than we're even gathering in, in rent or it's almost I think double um, of what we're, we're gathering in rent and so those are the issues that need to be fixed do you want to close the building or do you want to pursue a rehabilitation of that building? And I think that's really what's before you here today, that if we close that building, 
it doesn't take rehabilitation off the table, um, but at least provides us some more time. Otherwise, I would think if we're not going to be closing, I need to come back to you with a plan of what needs to be done to make that a viable building um, starting January 1 of 2020. Your Honor. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Having been the chairman of that board for quite a while, but then I dropped out. Now that I need the services, <laughs> I probably should be going back. <laughs> but anyway, um, we just, we just, the council just added two new parks and we're talking about doing more stuff so people have some place to go and some place to do something. And I think it's wrong to even think about kicking these people out. I think it's wrong unless we have a place for them to go because they're just as important to this community. Matter of fact, um, I, how do I want to put this nicely? Um, the majority of the people going there are the people that that make major contributions to city funding and when we're going out and asking people to to fund something privately those people um, dig in their in, in their pocketbooks because they can't afford it and I think we need to provide them with the same service that we're providing everybody else in this town and kicking them out is I'm not in favor of that at all I unless we have a place for them to go and we're going to help them with it um, I'm not I, I I can't do that I agree with them um, councilman Lamer, that yes we do need to have services and also with uh, councilman hoop that we need to have services for all those um, all members of our community I do think that we need to put forth a study of other sites that would be <coughs> excuse me more economical and more practical for the use I think within our community we have a number of those facilities that maybe we could partner with some other people um, we will have our own facilities the police department or the um, the fire department when those buildings are vacated so we have some other facilities that maybe would cost less or be more economical to use I worry that this building the physical building will cost an extremely high amount to rehabilitate to the ADA standards and I think that that will put us we need to decide the the um, how we are going to go about whether that building is worth saving or whether we can find another facility that we have that will work just as well but I agree I don't think that we should we should just say find your own facility I think that we should be um, an active participant in that but I also agree that if we are just being the landlord we need to be very economical about what we're doing and and I I would hope Mayor Greer would say this and in our conversation with them was it in no way we just want to boot you out on the street we had brought up the the conversations about other facilities which would be vacated um, by December 31st 2019 or sooner and so uh, whatever however you want me to spend my time is your prerogative and so if you want me to work with them to find other places I don't think that was ever taken off the table my advice to you is that we should not be in a landlord tenant situation um, and that that building is going to be one that is going to continue to cost us and how long can we continue to have a general fund where that's going to be a cost that will be there on an ongoing basis tell me why we can't be the landlord I I would just I think Justin's there to tell you um, that we've deferred maintenance every year that I've been your yeah. public works director I would guess we could spend a quarter of a million dollars today just to keep it going no no really I don't mean on improvement. that building I just mean you said yeah. you don't want to so be you I'll don't want to be in that type of a situation yeah. because what's not we're a, we're a landlord for every park in town for the aquatic center owners. for all that other stuff for everybody else why can't we be a landlord for them um, what I would say is what is not reflected on that 
uh, budgetary sheet that's showing that next mm -hmm. year we're budgeting a $29,800 loss on that is the amount of staff time that is spent there. And so ultimately we have basically one um, facilities manager and then two facilities people to cover everything outside of parks. And as you can imagine, we do have a lot of buildings with facility needs. And so any time that we're, we're um, needing to keep a building up to a certain standard because we've specified that we would keep it up to that standard for whoever's paying the rent, that's where we have issues. And I, I don't know what the workload is currently for Dave and, and his unit, but I do know that they're pretty frequently busy uh, around the city with other facilities that are used in our in our operations. Um, no, you had anything? Fair statement. No, I was just going to bring up that we've deferred maintenance for at least four or five years now, and we we're about at the point of no return where next year the chickens may come home to roost, and we may have to spend a quarter of a million dollars and not even not even really get anything out of it other than keeping the lights on and the doors open. Your Honor, uh, uh, just a question. Have we ever approached them about, uh, or uh, I know it's probably new to them somewhat, but have we ever uh, in the conversation uh, uh, thought about giving them the property and let them take up the, the uh, upkeep and the ADA requirements without letting any information out? Uh, only because I know a few of the people that are on the board, so uh, that may be a, it may be a possibility. Uh, I had thought all along when I brought up the the uh, initial idea of utilizing the Coliseum upstairs for that purpose, or the or the basement, depending on that, and found that we could not get any grant money if we if we went along with the the whole remodel. I've also changed an attitude if we leave some of that and upgrade uh, the rest of the Coliseum into a usable uh, facility other than expanding the, the uh, court system. Uh, I know that's a, a, a pretty close to a losing proposition itself. Um, I still think there's some possibilities with the Coliseum and also with the Senior Citizen Center. I guess that would be two different options, but seems like we've put off the Coliseum uh, remodeling effort uh, other than just getting to the fact that we couldn't get grant money with leaving it partly the way it is. Uh, so it seems to be a dead issue, uh, which I'm sure is, is a uh, bitter pill for a lot of the veterans in this community. Uh, that being said, I think that's a possibility that you could look into. Well, just to clarify on the Coliseum, it is not a dead issue. We have a consultant, an architect, an engineer working on plans and specifications now, which are to be complete by June 30th for the um, proposal to remodel it per the feasibility study, which was not making it um, compliant with uh, uh, historical standards. And so you're going to have to have a conversation very soon about the future of the Coliseum, probably as soon as those um, plans and specs are done and what, what you want to do at that point. So that conversation will be coming up. I just don't think that it will be, if you said move tomorrow on doing something dramatic over there with, with the plans and specs, that even by December 31st, 2019 would be hard. It's probably something that's a 2020 beyond project. And so that's where I think there's, there's, you know, the Coliseum is something that they said would be very desirable, but it's not um, currently what I would say is on a timeline where um, you all would be able to move forward with that project to accommodate uh, 2019. Well, the reason I, I made that statement is because <laughs> I've been working on it for at least three years that I know of to try to get that to a point of, of revitalization. Uh, and that being said, I, uh, I, didn't realize that we were doing and that's maybe that would have been fair to say that that should have been a memo to the council that that this was ongoing uh, it seems like uh, we get to a point and the uh, the last thing that, uh, or the one of the items that comes up that we don't normally know too much about is brought up at a council meeting and it tends to leave uh, uh, us in a vulnerable state that uh, we don't know what's going on in the city uh, I regret saying that uh, public because I should have brought it up uh, in a private conversation, but I think the city, uh, us as leaders, 
uh, of the community, the, the citizens of, of uh, Marshalltown expect us to know what's going on in this city. And when we get phone calls, uh, like I did over the weekend, why the aquatic center was not open, uh, probably 11 of them on my home phone, and, and I had at least six of them uh, on my cell phone. So that being said, uh, I think we, we try to do the best we can with the knowledge we have. And when we're confronted with some of this out in the public and we don't have that knowledge, it, it uh, tends to leave egg on our face. And uh, I hate to be in that position. Uh, I've lived here for uh, a number of years, uh, went past my anniversary of 44 years here in the city. And it frustrates me to no point that we do not get all the information on a timely basis. And if that's uh, a fault of ours as, as a council, then, then I would like to change that. But uh, there's too many ongoing things in this city that, that we need uh, information on. And, and uh, before I step down off my soapbox, uh, I would just like to make that clear that a lot of times we don't get some of that information and a very hard for us to be out in the community as the forefront for our city. And that being said, I will yield. In, in fairness, Council Member Gowdy, um, since the council did approve the contract with GTG, uh, there were some initial meetings related to energy efficiency and what we were looking for there, which were many months ago. But there have not been any, there's not been anything provided other than they're continuing to develop those plans and specifications. So there really has not been an update to give you other than their work is ongoing. But the contract date of June 30th is when they're supposed to provide us um, that information. So I apologize if uh, that's information we haven't kept out there. Um, but ultimately, there was not a new update to provide at the point in time I think it was about a year ago that the Thai Foundation um, donated was it twenty five thousand dollars for the feasibility study so we did approve that to two, uh, two years ago wow feasibility study. Mm -hmm. two years yeah. so if if this is something that I will say to what council member Gowdy had said previously and I had confirmed with mayor Greer we did not ask them if they wanted the building um, they did not make any known proclamations that they would like the building but if you would like us to at least ask that question to both entities as to whether or not they would be willing to um, uh, purchase the building uh, we can certainly bring this back for future discussion but I also just want you to to really know the lay of the land here is that um, if December 31st 2019 is not there out there as an oper or as an option to close the facility we need to be planning for that facility very much the same way we are planning for the Coliseum at this point we, we did have a discussion too about um, opening the doors to discussions with people like those that are running the Fisher Community Center I know there are three groups now that are working on turning that into a a museum and uh, and improving the artwork there's there's plenty of space there the uh, heritage center at the at the uh, Y might be another dialogue that that the uh, senior center could have with uh, um, the Y the Y folks and there are other spaces around town that are uh, available too many of which are way less expensive to heat and cool and nicer, frankly, than this building. It, the deferred maintenance in this building makes me ashamed to walk in there, truly. And I'm 65 years old, I qualify. I'd go in for the, for the board meetings and, and would just think this is, this is awful. We need a big benefactor to give a lot of money to build a, a nice new senior center because little towns have better places than we've got here for the seniors. That's right. But in the meantime, I do recommend uh, that we give the staff direction, and we probably need to have a deadline out there so that the seniors, the seniors know that they need to be looking. Fa fa failing of, um, is there we we can more bring discussion? it back for continued discussion too. Since we haven't had a motion to direct staff, we probably need to do that. I think the continuing discussion or continued discussion means that you should reach out or we should reach out to these groups. I think you have already and mentioned things, but 
maybe it does need further discussion, but I don't have any. Uh, my suggestions for other places are not meaningful, I don't think, but um, depends on their needs. So you can either go ahead with a part of this, as far as I'm concerned, or put it into a motion for direction. It's, it's really up to you. Um, if this comes back for future discussion, I think we would try and put together some initial, uh, a list of the maintenance items that would, not only maintenance items, but actual um, projects that would need to be done with some cost estimates so you get the other side of the picture as well um, if we're going to try and keep that facility open. And so what I want you to think about, and, and I get that this is a difficult conversation, we're talking about a building we're not talking about the quality of these two organizations or their missions and the things that we're doing. And so there are other facilities, I think 2019, December 31st, 2019, is enough time that those conversations can happen about where to relocate. Um, but I, what I want you to be thinking about is that we have responsibility for that building, um, whether or not we're renting it or otherwise. That, that's our responsibility. Your Honor. Yes. I would move to the, the staff go ahead and, and, and start the process of putting together a lease, but I want something in the lease that says that 2019 or December 19 and 19, 2019, that if, if these people don't have a place to go, we're not kicking them out. The lease can be extended until proper location is found that's suitable for them to do what they need to do. I'm, I'm willing, I, I, I know the building costs a ton because I used to help pay some of those bills. <laughs> and, but I wanna make sure that these people understand that we're not kicking them out, that we're gonna help them and we're gonna find a place that's very suitable for them and we're gonna work with them to do it. And we're, we're gonna have a lease, but they need to understand that lease can be extended if we haven't found something. Okay. Is there a, is there a <laughs> second to that motion? Second. Any further discussion? I would be very concerned with language such as, as that in a lease because then we would have the liability to, if it extends past December 31st of 2019, then we would be in violation on January 1st if we have not done the updates. I would be more in favor of saying we would work with them to find an, a suitable spot if we have not come to a permanent location on 20, December 31st, 2019, that we would find a, a, a suitable spot until a full-time spot could be, could be um, secured. The big item is the elevator, right? I would so if, if the upstairs group, if we could find a place for them, but we haven't found one for the downstairs, we're not in violation because they're not going to use the elevator. P potentially, but I think the, that's the big yes. building cost. Um, yes. But the big operational cost is just the, 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 the insulation and, yeah, I mean, the, the facility itself. Okay, just so we're not, they understand we're not, we're going to work with them and we're going to find something that's suitable. Well, let me propose this, that uh, the staff kind of has an idea what our temperature is <laughs> and, and you can propose something at the next meeting. Uh, yeah, I was going to say I don't know if it'll be at the next meeting because I would like to talk to both organizations a little bit more. Um, but, but yes, at some point this would just start the process for me to have the authority to go and start negotiating. Everybody okay with that, or would you like to call? call I don't think we had a second. Yeah, we did. We did. And then. Oh, I um, missed it. So Lamer moved to start the lease, and extend it until the building is okay. Um, second by Gowdy, and then Cahill. So was yours an amendment, or was I that could make it an amendment. <laughs> I could make it an amendment to the motion that that the building would be vacated by um, December 31st, 2019, but suitable meeting space would be found until a permanent location, if a permanent location is not secured by that time. Is there a second to that amend amendment? I'll second. 
Let's vote on the uh, amendment. The amendment first. Roll call. On the amendment, we have Martin. Yes. Cahill. Yes. Gowdy. Yes. Hoop. Yes. Lamer. Yes. Okay, that passed. And so now let's vote on the amended motion. Martin. Yes. Cahill. Yes. Gowdy. No. Hoop. Yes. Lamer. Yes. Carried. Carried. Okay, last item of discussion is the Highway 14 corridor study. And I know that we had uh, Bolton and Mink representative here. Yeah, I, I was going to say I can take a moment to introduce Casey Byers, who um, has been our project manager for this. And we also have Jim Harbaugh, who was the principal with Bolton and Mink um, for this project. And so hopefully uh, it's, a, it's a big study. Um, it is out there on our website. And then you should all have a uh, paper copy as well. And I think Casey is going to give us some highlights here. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief in the interest of time here. Uh, but please understand this is a pretty complex document. You all have a copy of it. It's 130 pages. Sums up approximately five months of planning, uh, both improvements within the Highway 14 right away as well as outside of the right away um, for the area that we're calling the study area from Anson Street north to the, the river. Um, the contents of this document includes uh, a look at community profile, understanding uh, who lives in Marshalltown and comparing uh, this population uh, to similar corridors. Um, an in-depth analysis or uh, review of our public outreach process. Uh, and then it gets into kind of the visioning for the right of way improvements, uh, implementation strategies uh, for making uh, specific changes within the corridor that will ultimately craft the, the corridor visioning, which is the last section in the, in the document. Uh, overall, uh, there's, there's four main components of this, of this process. Again, keeping in mind that it's kind of two separate projects working as, as one with the, uh, the space within the public right-of-way and the space uh, on the exterior of the right-of-way. Uh, but the first process is to the first phase of the process is to collect information, uh, learn about the corridor, learn about the uh, the businesses and the residents here, and uh, learn kind of what are the challenges uh, that exist along the corridor. Uh, the second is to conceptualize the right of way, uh, look at making you know specific changes that are going to uh, make the the goals of the community uh, achievable and doing that within the right of way. Uh, it's important to understand with this project uh, that this is being kind of driven by the Iowa Department of Transportation's plans to resurface Highway 14, and they're gonna be uh, letting that project this fall. So as we, as we begin to talk about what improvements there are to be made, there are specific improvements that are somewhat timely uh, if they're meant to coincide with what the DOT's plans. Uh, just to understand what those are is they're going to be resurfacing uh, the, the street. They're not moving any curb lines. Uh, there are going to be some ADA improvements made at pedestrian ramps, but their primary focus is to repave the surface of, the, of Highway 14. The third piece here is to develop an implementation approach, and the fourth is to explore corridor potential. Uh, the implementation approach basically makes uh, you know, the land use planning principles and the, the corridor wide approach uh, a reality. A brief overview of our public facilitation plan. Uh, we've had several meetings. Uh, we had well over 800 uh, participants throughout this process. We held meetings in various locations throughout the corridor, trying to broaden our reach to the community and uh, make, make this an inclusive process. The five main uh, goals that were that came out of the understanding with the, the public and the, the input process um, are as follows. And the first one uh, is creating a safe corridor for all users. Uh, this is for vehicles. This is for pedestrians. This is for cyclists. Uh, anybody that uses the Highway 14 corridor, uh, there's there's safety improvements that that need to be made and and go above and beyond uh, simply a resurfacing project. Uh, as the DOT uh, currently has planned. 
the second goal is to increase economic vitality along the corridor. This looks at uh, promoting uh, development and uh, fostering businesses and, you know, catering to the, the businesses that have been well established here and trying to increase a little more activity uh, in this area. Create an att active and attractive open space. Uh, there's two uh, really high quality open spaces that anchor both ends of this corridor. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about what we can do uh, in the intermediate space, uh, kind of closer to downtown to make a more vibrant open space. The fourth goal is to improve land use compatibility. There's a lot of incompatible land use scenarios uh, along the corridor where you have industrial next to residential. Uh, it's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't bode well uh, for both and uh, th there's opportunities that we can improve that. And lastly, it's to improve uh, and, and increase walkability along the corridor, make it more pedestrian friendly. A quick look at uh, existing traffic volumes and crash history data uh, from 2013 to 2017. There's 221 reported accidents along this corridor from Anson Street North. There's 75 accidents that caused injury and one accident causing a fatality. Uh, approximately uh, $1.3 million in property damage as a result of these accidents. Uh, and on average, it costs about $5,800 per crash. Um, existing traffic volumes range from right around 13,000 vehicles a day on the south end of this down by Anson Street uh, and that that decreases as you go north uh, I think by the time you get to Woodland that's down around 7,000 vehicles a day uh, to put this in comparison um, you know we this project is, is kind of centered around one main concept and that's a road diet uh, scenario and I'll explain that more but um, that, that road diet is a four to three lane conversion um, with a one travel lane in each direction with a dedicated center turn lane. Uh, to compare the traffic volumes here to what the DOT considers to be um, kind of a threshold for their three lane roads, uh, they, they look at 20,000 vehicles a day as kind of that threshold for a, a three lane uh, road. This is a very diagrammatically looking at kind of all these concepts coming together in the plan. Uh, there's several areas that we've identified for um, as a study area for urban design, uh, which is kind of the, the, the latter part of this document. Uh, we looked at key locations for gateway monuments, uh, a lot of talk about signage. There are specific locations where it makes sense uh, to do that along this corridor. Uh, the blue bl blue box that extends the corridor, that's kind of our, our four to three lane uh, conversion. So again, we're, we're looking at that as a proposed improvement along the corridor, as well as uh, various trail and pedestrian connections at key locations. Within the document, there are essentially 10 different um, right-of-way improvement projects identified. Uh, in the document, we we describe them in plan view. Uh, there's various call outs with descriptions as to what some of the proposed improvements are within the right of way. Those are then accompanied by a cross section analysis, which looks at the existing cross section for those locations and what the proposed uh, cross section could be. In certain scenarios, uh, like the one from uh, the viaduct to state, there's actually a couple different scenarios that could be considered for this area. Uh, again, um, this is just based on kind of what the space allows and what the, the right-of-way has potential for. Uh, one thing I do want to point out with these, um, and I'm going to use this example of the area from Woodbury to Riverside. This is the most narrow, the narrowest uh, portion of the right-of-way uh, along this entire corridor. It's 56 feet wide. Um, what you have now is four travel lanes uh, that are 11 feet wide and that goes to the face of the curb. Um, we have about a two foot buffer strip between the sidewalk and then we have a four foot sidewalk. With that four to three lane conversion, that road diet scenario, uh, we're able to get an 11 foot travel lane in each direction with a 12 foot center turn lane and actually have a two foot buffer outside of that travel lane for curb and gutter. Uh, that's something that's not accounted in your current cross section. Uh, that four-foot boulevard space uh, between the sidewalk and the street now becomes a much uh, more comfortable scenario 
and a, and a little more space and separation between vehicles and pedestrians. This is an existing look at this uh, particular cross section. And then here's the proposed uh, improvement strategy uh, for, for how that could be changed. Again, just, just the, the, the change in space between the sidewalk and the, and the street is, is dramatic. Uh, it makes a considerable amount of difference there. Uh, other things that this doesn't represent uh, really is just what this does uh, from a site distance uh, standpoint. At certain intersections, buildings are right up to the edge of the right of way. It's very difficult to see oncoming traffic. Um, this actually bumps out the travel lane a little further, pro provides a little more site distance uh, to the oncoming vehicles. A uh, couple other things to note on this uh, image uh, there's potential for uh, decorative street lighting. Uh, you can bury the, the electrical feed that, that, that runs along the e existing uh, roadway. Uh, so it kind of cleans up that a bit and also provides more space uh, for where that, uh, those utilities are placed. Here's another example uh, down at the very north end of the study area. Uh, by executing this concept, here's the potential for what proposed improvements could look like uh, down the road. Uh, one of the, the primary areas that was discussed among uh, community and uh, the city staff uh, were the Marion Street intersection and the Riverside Street intersection, as well as um, a, a potential for rerouting truck traffic trying to provide an opportunity to get, get trucks uh, safely to their destination without impacting so many residents and uh, pedestrians. Um, as part of a, an immediate or kind of near-term improvement recommendation is to improve the Marion Street intersection. This is where the one fatality uh, occurred um, in 2017. Uh, the other piece on this graphic uh, that we identified was uh, to realign the Riverside Street intersection, kind of get rid of that kind of weird boulevard space there and the separated travel lanes and clean up um, and align that intersection so it's, it, it's, it's not so confusing and uh, it could potentially reduce conflicts at that location. So for each one of the, uh, I'm not going to go through every improvement project, so I'm just picking a few of the ones that came up the most during our process, but now, uh, the notion of, of this connection uh, or extension of Edgewood was something that uh, we conceptualized during the process. Um, this is a completely new roadway uh, that would take, take trucks and other vehicles um, from Edgewood and tie them into North 8th Avenue. Um, there's approximately 150 to 200 trucks uh, that are coming in and out of the JBS facility uh, alone every day and a lot of them are using the Marion Street intersection, which really currently isn't designed to handle truck traffic. Um, so an, an alternate means would be just a completely different route to get them to where they're going and get them away from the residential neighborhood and uh, reducing the impact on a lot of the businesses that have established and are calling uh, this uh, Highway 14 corridor home. So at the end of that section of the right-of-way improvements uh, is, a, is, a, is a table that looks at each improvement area and then it lists the primary project components of each project or phase, uh, potential funding sources uh, that look at transportation-related uh, improvements, and then an overall budget range. Uh, this is very conceptual and this is a very planning level uh, look at each one of these projects. Uh, so under, please understand that the budget uh, for each one of these is, is, is meant to, you know, kind of be conservative really and uh, cover the broad range of, you know, unknowns that we, we don't have, that we, that are out there right now. Uh, we do include, um, to the best of our ability, as much detail as we can in those numbers. Uh, there's a contingency in there uh, to cover things that we don't know as well as planning and uh, engineering fees as well. Uh, these costs also include uh, general pavement improvement costs uh, that would actually be uh, contributed by the Iowa DOT as part of their resurfacing funds. So 
outside of the right of way, uh, looking at kind of chapters five and six of this document, uh, we've identified five key study areas um, that are really derived by community input and uh, our understanding of the corridor and, and where potential, um, you know, improvements could happen uh, that are seemingly lower hanging fruit than, you know, than certain others. Uh, so I'm just going to list these off. One, the first one is Anson Street uh, to Lynn Creek, kind of on the very south end of the, the corridor study area. The second is the East, Mad East Madison Street to, to Lynn Street. This is what we refer to as the viaduct area, uh, just on the north side of the viaduct. The third being Lynn Street to State Street, which is essentially the downtown core. Bromley Street to Riverside Street. This is kind of our north residential transition area. Uh, this is where all the primary uh, residential exists along the corridor. And then the fifth one is uh, Marion Street uh, north to the river. So I'm just gonna walk through kind of how this document was set up uh, so you have a, a better understanding of what all this information is. It's, this is complex, there's a lot of information here, a lot of recommendations, but this is meant to provide an incremental framework uh, for making improvements uh, both within the right-of-way and outside of the right-of-way um, as you begin to you know, realize the vision for the Highway 14 corridor. Uh, so there's a matrix that follows this, um, but it's essentially it, it consists of uh, six primary steps. Uh, the first, to build a framework, uh, develop potential rezoning or updates to your zoning code and potential design guidelines and things of the like to guide land use planning and uh, redevelopment within this area. The second is recruiting and communication. Um, kind of begin discussing the potential with developers, investors, and property owners. So there's recommendations for how to go about starting that conversation. <clears throat> the third is to incentivize, uh, create incentives if possible. Uh, this is both monetary as well as uh, organizational um, incentives. Uh, build support and partnerships. Uh, that's you know a key component of this is to, to build support. And so there's recommendations in here about what certain things the city might do to, to build the support for certain projects. Uh, the fifth one is to research and reinvest. Uh, you know, you're gonna learn things, learn, learn what's working, what's not working. Uh, there's recommendations for, you know, how to adapt the process and uh, look at reinvesting in the, in, in the potential uh, projects. And then, you know, ultimately as, as projects happen and, uh, scenarios are, are executed, um, you're gonna revise this framework and you're gonna make adjustments uh, based on what's working and what's uh, <coughs> proved most valuable. So to just to summarize how this matrix was set up and how it should be used, um, we start by identifying the recommendation. You know, what is it? Uh, we, we identify what, what, what type of recommendation is. Is it a zoning code improvement? Is it a program? Is it a funding mechanism? Um, what scale is it? Is it a city scale, district scale, site scale? Uh, who, who's responsible? Who's the organizing entity? Like where, where, should this, where should this recommendation start? Who should own it? And then uh, ultimately, you know, why, why is it important? What's the implication and what's the goal? Uh, moving this along, you know, we prioritize these. So we kind of give a high, medium, or low priority. Um, and then ultimately we identify kind of who benefits. Is it, is it the community? Is it uh, the economy? Is it art? Is it the environment? These are all kind of four, four ways of identifying uh, kind of you know, who's benefiting from this. So for each one of those kind of six components of this, this framework, we've identified a, a list of recommendations. Um, so this is gonna take some time to, to understand and, and to go through, but um, you know, we've provided several scenarios within here, within each one of these study areas where we, where we indicate or we uh, conceptualize if, if these things were put in place and if these recommendations were put into practice, how does that change the site? How does that change the location? Uh, so I'm just gonna walk through one scenario and this is one that's seemingly gained a lot of traction uh, through our planning process um, and has created a lot of conversations uh, with community members. And this is the area um, which is on the north side of the viaduct. 
you have these uh, the items identified in red here are either vacant or unoccupied parcels or owned by the city. Um, there's approximately like seven to 10 acres of, of land here that is sitting vacant. Um, we looked at kind of what a potential phased approach could be uh, to, to taking this location and revitalizing it and looking at redevelopment potential for it. Uh, this is, you know, as you come across the viaduct, this is kind of your, your entering downtown. Um, there's a key location here for potential gateway opportunity. Uh, we look at abandoning the, the existing ramps uh, to Madison and, and the viaduct and look at actually uh, taking Nevada Street and, and making it a, a pass-through street and connecting it. Uh, the first phase could be just creating an open green space. The second phase could be creating some dedicated parking that could be <coughs> could fill, facilitate uh, future buildings or neighboring uh, properties. Third phase, again, you know, this could be three years, this could be 10 years down the road, but would look at, you know, some, some infill of mixed use development, some medium to higher density affordable housing, uh, commercial retail. Um, there's a lot of possibilities for this area. And, you know, the, the kind of the side benefits of this, you start looking at dedicating parking for some of the established businesses here. Um, you look at possible some access management and some sharing of parking areas to reduce curb cuts. That's a huge component of, of this, of the issues that are out here along the corridor today is access management and the number of curb cuts and where people are turning. There's considerable amount of conflicts along the corridor. Here's a conceptual rendering of, you know, what this particular scenario, you know, could look like. Uh, you have the potential for some kind of two to three, maybe four story mixed use development uh, immediately off the viaduct. You look at potentially repurposing some of the historic buildings here. Uh, you're, you got some gateways, some public art, some sculpture here uh, to kind of liven up the pedestrian space. But, um, you know, it's a certain, certain potential here. And as we look at where the low hanging fruit is, you know, we start to identify, you know, where the vacant properties are. And, you know, that's why we've identified this one as a, as a potential uh, spot. So ultimately, um, you know, it's the, the city will need to, to make a decision on kind of where to start. Um, we've identified a few a few steps in uh, starting the process of implementing change here, and uh, particularly by making some decisions as it relates to the DOT's project and what the priorities are along the corridor, and what potential uh, right of way improvements need to happen to coincide with the DOT project. Um, a couple cu couple items to understand is, uh, as I've already mentioned, they're going to be letting that project this fall. Uh, we've had conversations with the DOT in several meetings about potentially delaying uh, the resurfacing of the portion that we're talking about today, and that's from Anson Street North. Um, the funding that the DOT has allocated for the resurfacing improvements would not go away. They would table that for potentially a year or two um, to be put back in at a later date. Um, but ultimately, they want to work with the city. Uh, they understand that there's a need for safety improvements. Uh, we've brought to light uh, several things for them to consider uh, that are well beyond uh, just resurfacing the road. Um, but ultimately, the, the city will need to evaluate your priorities, uh, set a budget for what the city's involvement uh, is for phase one, uh, conduct a traffic study of the corridor, as well as look at an access management study uh, along the corridor, and then review the DOT's uh, financial investment potential. Uh, there's, based on different scenarios, there's different degrees of funding that could be available from the DOT. Uh, specifically in the in the conversation of resurfacing or complete reconstruction. And then uh, ultimately evaluate the public infrastructure conditions. There's certain locations where there's uh, sanitary sewer, storm sewer improvements um, that could be um, timely, um, may make sense to do now rather than wait, uh, considering if the road's gonna be tore up, so. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it there. Um, I, 
that's a very quick overview of this 130 pages of information. So <laughs> I expect there's some questions. Um, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? Yeah, out of all that talking you just did, uh, what I'm looking at is delaying the the overlay or whatever they're going to do to this corridor, and you're and supposedly the city approved this delay potentially. So you're going to delay it for two or three years, but you're talking about a 10-year plan. So how do you how do you implement the 10-year plan to fit into that two to three-year delay? <clears throat> um, so to me, the most important part is getting the uh, getting the corridor, both of them, uh, resurfaced. Mm -hmm. So there's certain improvements, uh, such as widening sidewalks and creating more separation between pedestrians and the and vehicles, uh, that are just simply not possible to do without kind of going above and beyond the resurfacing of the road. And th this is specifically in the area that the community identified as kind of the number one place to, to start with improvements. And this is that area kind of from State Street north to essentially Marion, um, where we have that narrow right of way. So in our conversations with the DOT, it has been, you know, if you let this project in the fall, they're gonna come in, resurface the road and they're not going to change curb lines. They're not going to reduce the width of the, the roadway. And it's essentially, you know, it, it's, going to, it's going to be an improvement. It's going to be a, a re, resurfaced roadway. Um, but it's, you know, <coughs> short of tearing up that uh, freshly resurfaced road and or coming in and, and making additional improvements at a later date, um, which will create additional disturbance. Um, the conversation was, we could potentially delay it if the city wants to consider additional improvements uh, that go beyond that resurfacing um, and and do it at a later date. Um, the, the condition of the roadway probably isn't going to change dramatically in two years, but it'll allow the city to study this a little more, uh, study the traffic signals uh, and the timing, as well as the turning movements at key intersections and make some more informed decisions. Um, and, and the fear was that if the DOT resurfaced the roadway, it kind of closes the door, if you will, on, um, on other improvements to the roadway because nobody's really gonna wanna come in and, and tear up that, that newly paved surface. So some of these improvements are more immediate as they tie in closer to what the DOT is proposing. Some of them are longer term, uh, there's kind of some some immediate short-term, near-term improvements here, and there's there's certainly improvements in here that are, you know, 20, 40 years down the road. But they're they're items to consider now as the city starts, you know, to look at land use planning and other improvements. I, I think to follow up on that specifically, um, in those priority projects, there are a number outside funding sources that have been identified, which are grants and other things. Um, that we would certainly need time to pursue and potentially be awarded, um, you know, before the, the DOT would be able to do that project if we wanted those things to happen at the same time. Um, the other thing, you know, we're, uh, I guess it's, it's almost June, so that means it's just about budget time again, uh, where we look at our capital improvement plan. And so that's where I think there's, there's a conversation about some of those items. Are, are there some of those things that y we could start fitting in there into our capital improvement plan, looking at um, some of the identified sources that we've said we would have locally, such as road use tax fund dollars. Um, what is our street improvement plan you know, for some of the future years as you talk about Riverside being something that we ne would need to be repaved as it was reconfigured. And so that would really be where those things start to hit those planning process that we have internally um, so that we can start to incorporate changes. So it's not like you have to do this big you know, drop everything right now, how do we get this done? That we have planning processes in place where this would start to fit in. Other questions or comments? Well, thanks, Casey. I'd like to compliment you and your company on the uh, good job at the public uh, hearing. So we got to, uh, 
ask any questions we wanted to and make any suggestions that we had. We do have two motions that we're requesting. Oh, okay. Um, so the first motion that we're requesting is a procedural one to accept the Highway 14 corridor study. So moved. I'll second. Any discussion? I would, oh, oh, sorry. I would uh, be in favor of accepting their, their work That's what it is. without the provision that there's, there's nothing in here that we're approving to be done, correct? Correct. Yep. Right. Right. Roll call. Cahill? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Lamer? Yes. Martin? Yes. Carried. And then the second motion that we are requesting relates to what Casey just talked about, which is a motion to ask the DOT to reschedule the maintenance project for the Highway 14 corridor from Anson Street to the Iowa River Bridge. I will make one comment, and I think Michelle, Casey, or Justin can confirm. They did identify, or we identified one area within that corridor, um, which really would need some immediate addressing in 2019 with their project, was toward, more towards the Iowa River Bridge. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe it was the area from Woodland Street North. Uh, okay. That was identified as it's in bad shape now and probably needs to be repaired first. And it's really not affected by the other improvements that are south of there. So that's what we're looking for in terms of a, a motion, knowing that they, they, they have identified, we have identified what that worst portion is in terms of pavement condition and that that could be included, would be included in the rest of the work to happen on, on Highway 14 um, south of Anson Street in 2019. I move. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Your Honor, if I can just for a moment, I do think that as we look at this, we have to have a better a plan rather than just going by what the DOT's time frame. I am very pleased that they were willing to work with us on the time frame, but this is an opportunity for us to improve this north side of the city especially and I think we ought to take advantage of it and uh, have it well planned out from our part of what we can do and what we can um, put forward with funds to make this an action that really improves our city well put any other comments call the roll please Gowdy yes Hoop. yes Lamer yes Martin yes Cahill yes carried thank you and the final item is the discussion of funding for the 4th of July fireworks. Anybody want to take that one on? I would, I would make one statement towards it that we need, uh, if we could have someone contact Louisa or Tega, I believe, who is the chairman of her one person committee and find out if she is actively pursuing uh, fireworks uh, this year because I think last year we came up short of money and there was a lot of confusion and, and problems and I'm not sure how active she's been and I would hate to commit money to a, to a fund that would be in trouble. I'm all in favor of doing it. I think it's a very good uh, item to work on uh, for a community. But uh, if we're the only one contributing, then I think we'd be in trouble. Let's uh, just take that as a, a suggestion that staff follow through with her. Any other comments? We are at uh, item K is a matter of public comment. Uh, to shorten it, uh, please keep it to three minutes and uh, let others be able to speak as well. Any public comment? Can I ask one question at this time? You bet. Your Honor. Um, as Mr. Gowdy said, can you please share the Aquatic Center opening dates and how that is working? Um, what their schedule is for this early part of the summer that we seem to have jumped into head first. Parks or? 
I was going to say Anselmus is out sick today. Um, the Aquatic Center did open yesterday. And so I was just looking to see if the hours are posted on our website. But if not, I can certainly have her email those out to you. I, I know from having been on the Park and Rec Board before I got on the council that typically that date is set uh, it is way, way ahead of time. It's actually set in our operations agreement with the um, uh, YMCA. The, the woman I sleep with had the same question, that's hot out, why don't we have kids in the pool? <laughs> so. Well, that was, that, was, that was the question you were getting many calls on. Yeah. Um, I can report, uh, it opens Monday, May 28th, um, and then June 2nd and 3rd, uh, then June 6th through August 19th. So um, we are closed this week, but then we'll be open on the weekend. Um, it does not list hours that's fine the dates the oh, dates are are helpful thank it you it coincides with um school school letting out yep mm -hmm. thank you hello there everybody lonnie hoagland 909 stegman i see your rules up here it says for me to speak for three minutes and to address you guys i there you go i uh really appreciate your work uh you're doing all you can do i appreciate that um I sent you guys, I believe every one of you, a little packet in the mail that I want to use the word as a complaint, but not a mean, nasty complaint. It was just something I noticed in my travels. I deal in junk cars. Uh, I noticed at one intersection is a residential neighborhood, four junk vehicles in one area. You're talking about Third Avenue and all this curb appeal. I'm not sure where you're at on the front yard parking or the new code enforcement officer that's on staff, but I think it's something you need to really work on. Curb appeal, give the police department the ability somehow to enforce a law that's gonna work. Uh, I'm not talking about junk cars, I'm talking about junk cars and trash and junk. Uh, do something that'll work. I guess the word I heard Al Hoop say in some of his comments today, frustrated. I'm frustrated that I talk to people and they say, it looks nasty. Um, I'm frustrated that you guys can't talk to me right now. I don't know how I bring this up, who I bring this up to, what can I do to get rid of this trashy part of Marshalltown. We got really nice area where our middle income area is going away and I don't know that it's just the low income that's causing this nasty part, but with that said, someone give me some feedback later that's what i've got thank you happy to um for one uh, our code enforcement officer is kind of buried uh, we didn't have one for two years so uh, he's trying trying to play catch up but but he's been very responsive to the complaints that i know that we've made um, my wife and i have him on speed dial and i'll, I'll bet we outnumber everybody else that makes complaints about things i have suggested that he he condense the main code items you know how uh, what, what the height can be of the weeds uh, where you can park your car can't park your car and i'll try to condense it onto a business card that we could then get to all the police officers uh, and anybody that walks into the police station or city hall here so that people can can know that and report it and then i did have a dialogue with joe who's our new a code enforcement officer about the, the fact that 20 years ago we had over 20 people who were volunteers and that required a lot more work than it does anymore. You had to go to the courthouse to look up the Sidwell number. You had to come here to this building and pick up the uh, uh, camera, take it out, take pictures, re return it with that information. It's now a lot easier to do the reporting and, and uh, prosecution. So um, I, I, I still like that idea. I thought it worked pretty well 20 years ago. And I think we could scare up people like you that, that really care about the way the city looks and uh, and make them available maybe even li like an advisory committee kind of like park and rec has an advisory committee uh, to help the code, code enforcement officer i don't want it to be a conflict of interest because i buy junk cars there's action auto parts hey everybody sell your car to action auto parts they're my competition but clean the town up and it's it's the garbage how do you guys let a trailer sit there with garbage bags in it and raccoons eating out of the garbage get a code that's enforceable and make them clean it up i don't I can't afford it well then make them figure it out somehow you can't let the garbage sit there i went to orlando florida for a touring convention 
And I was just disheartened when I come back to town. It's like, this is where I live. I'm sorry. That's past your three-minute rant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. And thanks for the packet. I think we, we forwarded your letter to the... Um, the it, it was, and, and that's office. where Michelle Sponheimer so he got is who it. you need to talk to for updates about yeah, that. Yeah, he got it. And Michelle Sponheimer is who you, who you should talk to for any of your complaints as well. She is the supervisor of the code enforcement inspector. It's bad that it, this is the wrong forum to do this, but of those four vehicles, two of them are gone because I've made a complaint. So they're gone. They're nasty. They're done. They're out of there. So Good. there's half of it. Good. Thanks. Any other members of the public wish to comment? Dustin? Oh. Sorry, I asked. To respond to Councilor Lamer, we are working on a schedule for spraying of mosquitoes. Uh, it takes an overnight action, which means they're not working in the normal working hours, which takes action through the union. So we're working on it in the next few weeks, hopefully. And, and I know there are people with allergies that need notice uh, before the spraying happens. So Correct. Protect I'll themselves. You build a nice deck so you can go outside and you go outside <laughs> and, and you, you sit there swatting them. So then you cover yourself with DEET and then so you, you go went in there. So I'm going to go there. Then you have to go in the house and take a shot. I'm going to repeat what I heard from the public works director in West Des Moines. Don't expect that it's going to affect anything in your backyard. When we spray along the center line of the street, it's meant to work from the street to the front of your house. It does not impact the mosquito population. That will be on you as a private property you can't owner. Get, make them make the circle drive? Uh, no, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Thanks. I will declare the meeting uh, adjourned at 2.24 p.m. Thanks for coming. So.